tonight. We're moving one of our themes in this class has been energy transitions. We've talked about that from many different perspectives. And we did spend one class talking about biking. And today we're going to talk about another concept about making streets more usable to all users. And we have, you know, we have the exact right person to do that because um, Roger, well, I'll introduce him in a minute here. There's a big organization, national organization called Smart Growth America. <coughs> Smart Growth America. And when you think about groups who are actively engaged in the transportation conversation at the national level about thinking about other ways of us going forward other than this totally car dependent society that we're in, Smart Growth America is at the forefront of that. Roger just finished working there as the vice president or deputy director. Vice president, yeah. Vice president. And as part of his job, he was director of something called the National Coalition for Complete Streets. So that was housed in Smart Growth America. So he's going to talk to us a lot about this concept of complete streets and designing systems that encourage other ways of using them aside from the car in addition to the car. When you guys think about graduating from here, what are some of the places that you want to live? Where would you like to go? Boston. Any other places that you're thinking about that you would like to go? Denver. Denver. Where else? Copenhagen. Copenhagen. What about Seattle? Chicago. Chicago. Vermont. I think of another one that often comes up when I ask you guys. Portland. Portland. All right. Why am I asking you that? Roger was involved in the 80s in designing Portland the way it is, or he'll tell you probably more about that. But one of the reasons Portland's so attractive to so many people is it's a place where you can walk and bike. And Seattle always comes up when I ask students where places they were going to live. Roger just took a job as deputy director at the Washington Department of Transportation, which, among other things, has the city of Seattle. Mm -hmm. So, if you're thinking about moving west, here's your contact. <laughs> For those of you guys sticking around, this is a famous intersection here at UVM, University Heights. Listen closely to what Roger has to say after the break. We are going to redesign this intersection. And we are going to fix it. And with Roger's stamp of approval, maybe. So we'll get the University of Vermont to do what should be done. Do you guys like crossing the street? No. All right. So let's give a very warm energy alternative welcome to Roger Millar. Here with us for the next hour. Great. Oh. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. And it's, it's great to be uh, back in Vermont. Uh, when I was with Smart Growth America, uh, we did a lot of work with VTRANS, the Vermont Agency of Transportation. So I spent, oh, I think I was up in Montpelier at least 15 times in the last four years. And it was nice to be able to come back and kind of be a tourist last weekend. Uh, and, and come here and be a little bit of a tourist. But uh, I am now the, the Deputy Secretary of the Washington State DOT. When I was at Smart Growth America, I managed the Complete Streets Coalition and I managed our DOT uh, innovation work program, which was looking at uh, smart growth transportation uh, solutions to some of the problems that the, the country is facing. Uh, I am not here as Deputy Secretary of the DOT in Washington State. I'm also not here as Smart Growth America. I'm just here as a guy on vacation. Um, but uh, maybe I learned a little bit at, at those places. And what I'll try to do is share some of that with you tonight. Um, I wanted to talk about complete streets, what complete streets are and what complete streets aren't. Uh, and then talk about the innovative DOT, which is not really an oxymoron. Um, 
we, we do have innovation in departments of transportation around the country. And then some demonstration projects that, uh, that we did in states around the country that, that may or may not be of interest to you. And I hope to have plenty of time for questions at, at the end of this. Uh, when I was working with Smart Growth America, I used to always make a point of defining smart growth so that other people wouldn't define it for me. Um, I did not work for the United Nations. I do not have a baby blue helmet. Um, I don't fly around in black helicopters, any of the stuff that sometimes you hear about ideas like smart growth and complete streets and livable communities and the rest of that. We are not a part of a worldwide conspiracy. We're just a small not-for-profit that uh, I think does some pretty cool stuff. But to us, complete streets is per, or complete streets, smart growth is about strategies that provide people in all kinds of communities, urban communities and rural communities and suburban communities with housing and transportation choices near jobs and shops and schools. And those strategies that provide people with housing and transportation choices are designed to support thriving local economies and protect the environment. So it's about providing people with choice. And uh, it's really absurd when you have somebody with a, a little tin hat come up and yell at you about how providing them with choices is taking away their freedom. So um, I am I'm really adamant to point out that we are, it's about choice. And if you choose to drive around in a big old car, that's fine with me as long as you pay the true cost of driving around in your big old car. Um, so housing and transportation choices near where uh, people live and where they work and where they play. Um, and uh, with that said, let's talk about complete streets. Um, a lot of communities want to know what they get for their investment in complete streets. And to answer that question, you know, we, the Complete Streets Coalition has been around for quite a while. We've advocated for complete streets policies all around the country. And one of the things we hear from uh, uh, in interested people is, well, what do I get? And what we did is we went out and looked at 37 projects that were built around the country, built um, based on complete streets principles. And we looked at uh, the data on safety and the data on performance and the data on the economics of the projects. And uh, you might find some of that interesting. But we'll start out with the basic question, why, why complete streets? Uh, why provide places like this? Um, this is not a complete street. It's got a lot of the elements of it, but you can see here uh, kind of this third world goat path along the highway that leads to this lovely transit facility. Um, and you can see in the background uh, the young couple pushing the stroller up the hillside from the lovely transit facility off of the goat path to get to a parking lot that they have to cross at risk of life and limb uh, to go shopping for, for groceries. So this is not complete streets. Uh, this is not complete streets. Uh, this is frankly kind of shameful, uh, but we've got this all over the country where people um, who uh, don't have the, uh, the luxury of walking are stuck going to very dangerous places to get their, their, their basic needs met. This is also not a complete street. It looks really nice at first blush, but uh, would you cross that street? And if, if so, where? <laughs> um, would you let your kid ride your, their bike or would you ride your bike on this street? This might be 45 miles an hour. Um, where do you get on and off the bus? One of the interesting things about taking the bus to and from work is at least once a day, you've got to cross the street. You either cross the street in the morning to get to the bus stop to wait for the bus, or if you live on the same side of the street as the bus stop, you have to cross the street in the afternoon when you get home. Where do you do that here? There are a lot of people that, that kind of put this, this eyewash, if you will, on what is effectively, um, we call it in civil engineering terms, a car sewer. Um, it's designed to make cars flow fast. Um, I'm a civil engineer. I went to civil engineering school at the University of Virginia. And what we learned in school was that uh, the, the area that you have and the velocity that things are, mo are moving at, velocity times area is, is flow, is throughput. And if you're a traffic engineer, what you're trying to do is maximize throughput of, of automobiles. And you do that at the expense of 
pedestrians and on street parking and transit and stuff like that because they create friction and that friction slows the cars down. And if what you're about is moving cars, then, then you don't want that kind of friction. You want something that's really slick like this so you can get as many cars as possible through. But what complete streets are about is ensuring that the entire right of way is planned and designed and operated and maintained to provide safe access for all of the users of the system. Now, 30% of Americans, 30% don't drive. They don't drive because they're too young to drive. They don't drive because they're too old to drive. They don't drive because they've done something brilliant in their lives that they no longer have the right to drive. Uh, they don't drive because they're disabled. They don't drive because they, they choose not to drive. But 30% of us don't drive a car. And uh, you know, you're not the right audience to talk to about this, but tomorrow I'm gonna be talking to AARP um, actually, you are the right audience to talk about this too, because you're actually in a position maybe to do something about it. AARP has done research. The average American male is going to outlive his ability to drive by seven years. And the average American woman is going to outlive her ability to drive by 11 years. So imagine how, how or think, how would you maintain your independence and your dignity and your quality of life when you have to hang up the car keys for the very last time. Because all over the country, people are, are realizing that. They, they can't see well enough to drive, or their reaction times are slow, and they've been told, no, we're not gonna issue you a driver's license. You have no choice but to get around some other way. Um, it, it's, it's a huge issue in the United States because a lot of people are turning 65 and older every day. We're living longer, that's a great thing, but how do we get around? And then as, as taxpayers and voters and leaders in your community, how are you gonna to pay to move all those folks around? Because when the seniors find out they can't drive anymore, the first thing they do is they call the transit agency to find out what their options are. When, how do I get that dial -a ride van to come pick me up to do the things that I need to do? We did some work with uh, the city of Bozeman, Montana, and Bozeman, has a fixed route system that goes on regular routes around town. Most communities, most communities of any size anyway, have these fixed route systems. And that bus costs the city of Bozeman, the taxpayers there, about $2.50 for every person that rides that bus. There's about a $2.50 investment that the public makes in making that transit system work. But the dial-a-ride service that provides trips to citizens door to door that costs $15 a ride. So if you can create a pedestrian network and a transit network that allows people to actually get safely to a bus stop, you can save a ton of dough um, by having more fixed route service and less demand responsive service, the, you know, the dial a ride kind of thing. So when we're talking about complete streets, we're talking about Streets that are planned and designed and operated and maintained for cars and trucks, absolutely, because they need to be a part of that mix. But they also work for transit vehicles. They also work for people who ride bicycles. They also work for people who walk. And they provide safe access for all of those users. Um, you guys here in, in, in this community, that, that one intersection aside, have pretty good access. I, I walked up here. I was, was kind of joking before that I was going to come to the work, the talk on complete streets and ask where the parking space was for my rental car. But I, I chose to walk up the hill instead and hopefully I won't freeze on the way back down the hill. Um, so anyway, this is what complete streets or policies are about in a, in, a, in a nutshell. There are many types of complete streets. Um, they fit a variety of contexts. In a rural, low volume, residential context, this is entirely appropriate. Um, w uh, someone uh, who graduated from the University of Vermont and went to graduate school down in Virginia and then I hired her when I was community development director in McCall, Idaho, is now the community development director of McCall, Idaho. And a lot of McCall streets look like this and they're perfectly fine in terms of, of being complete. Uh, they work. Complete streets does not equal bike lanes on every street. Complete streets does not mean 
road diets, shifting four lane roads to three lane roads and putting bike lanes on both sides and parking on both sides and all that. Those are really neat concepts in the appropriate places, you know, like here. But this is fine. This is fine in another rural context when you're zipping along Highway 7 or Highway 2 here in, in, in Vermont. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a, a, a multi-use path along the side of the road to provide people with, uh, with transportation choices? In a more residential neighborhood, you see a lot of this in, in your community, sidewalks and parking on both sides of the street. You really don't need in that kind of low volume, low speed environment, a bike lane. And what often happens when you, you apply this stuff without thinking about it, is you go in and have a knockdown drag out fight in that neighborhood about are you gonna have parking or bike lanes? Because there's not enough room for both. And, and why? It's a perfectly safe place to ride a bicycle without them. You get out on collectors and higher volume, higher, higher velocity streets and, and bike lanes begin to make sense. And then there are other places where you dedicate things like bus lanes for, for buses only and you do things like that. So there are lots of types of, complete, of streets that conform to complete streets policies, but it isn't a design prescription. Complete streets, again, it's a policy approach. What we're talking about with complete streets is changing the everyday decision-making processes and systems that a community has. I uh, had a conversation with the district engineer for the Detroit region, uh, the metro region of the Michigan Department of Transportation. And we were talking, he says, Roger, you know, if I took our complete streets manual and pulled the cover off of that and put the cover of our street design manual on it, that would achieve all the things that I'm trying to achieve. And I said, you know, hallelujah, he's got it. I don't need to worry about complete streets in his district anymore. It's about changing how we make decisions. And it's about making long-term changes to the built environment. This stuff doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. So what it's not is it's not a special street project. We have a lot of uh, elected officials that get really excited about complete streets. They, they go to a conference and they see it or they read about it in Governing Magazine or something like that. And they, they call up their public works director and they yell them to get me one of them there, complete streets, so I can take credit for it. Um, and then they've got it and they check it off and they go on about, so it's, it's, that's not what complete streets are about. And complete streets is not, as I said before, it's not a design prescription. I spoke to the uh, Institute of Transportation Engineers at their international conference uh, down in Florida a couple months ago. And in a room full of engineers, what's a complete street? They, they thought it was a road diet. They thought it was taking a four lane road and making it a three lane road with a turn lane in the middle and taking the space that was uh, that was uh, saved up from that and putting bike lanes down both sides of the street. So if I've got parking and bike lanes and a center turn lane, I've got a complete street. Now that's, it's a thing called a road diet or you know, right sizing the street, but that's just one technique to make complete streets happen. Complete streets is not a mandate for immediate retrofit. We have a lot of people that say, well, we can't adopt the policy like that because we can't afford it. You can't afford to change how you make your mind up about what you do because that's all Complete Streets is really about is how you think through the process of designing and building and operating and maintaining your system. Another thing that Complete Streets is not is it's not a silver bullet. A lot of folks like, okay, we've, we've done Complete Streets, everything should be wonderful. The sky will turn blue, the economy will prosper. You know, that, that's not what happens. Um, a lot of other stuff has to happen. We certainly have to address land use. Um, I do a lot of work with the Congress for the New Urbanism and the folks at CNU don't like complete streets because the complete streets policy addresses what happens in the right of way. And they're saying, well, we're not done until we address what happens on the private side of the property line and we have better uh, building form and better building use. I, yeah, you're absolutely right, but that's not complete streets. We have to consider land use too. We have to consider environmental issues. Uh, another one that I get uh, tagged with quite often is green streets. I love rain gardens and, and you know, more um, uh, biological ways of addressing stormwater runoff with greenscape as opposed to grayscape. I, I, I would rather see 
stuff go into a swale and absorbed into the ground after it's clean than to see it run off and go into a stream through a series of progressively larger pipes. But um, quite often we get into this debate about, okay, we've only got so much space, do we put sidewalks or greenscape? Do we put bike lanes or greenscape? It becomes an either or thing. And I suggest to communities that again, it is specific to the context that the, the particular street's in. And what you don't want to do is put so many ornaments on Charlie Brown's Christmas tree, which may be an analogy that you guys don't get, but um, that it doesn't, that doesn't happen. Getting a complete streets policy adopted can be a huge lift in a community. But adding to it the green street stuff, that's, that's going to make enough other people angry that it's probably not going to pass. So you, you want to make sure that you don't have um, your policies. It, it ought to be a part of a suite of policies that a community has, but it's not, it's not the silver bullet. The other thing you need to think about is transportation demand management, how you address the demand for the system. Do you allow carpooling? Do you allow teleworking um, as, as an employer? Um, do you have flexible work hours? One of the things that considers, continues to just amaze me is how people insist on working eight to five so that they can go out at five and get stuck in traffic with everybody else instead of coming in a little earlier, leaving a little earlier, figuring out a schedule that, that works for you. But managing demand for transportation is another huge part of this that is not complete streets. So one of the things we hear about quite often with complete streets is, well, how are we going to pay for this? Um, what complete streets policies are about is using existing sources of money differently. It would be wonderful if all the money in the world were available. That was my first thought when I, I got into the engineering world. And then I realized it's, it's like writing a paper. It's really easy to write a long paper. It's really hard to write a short one. You know? And it's really easy to deal with transportation wastefully and extravagantly and in ways that really don't work at the end of the day if you have all the dough in the world. I mean, that's what happened to our country with the interstate system is we had all this money to build roads and we, we built roads everywhere and now we're trying to recover from that and we don't have the funding to do it. So this isn't about new money. This is about using the money that you have differently um, you know, retrofitting streets is important, but you don't have to retrofit all of your streets day one. You know, th this is a, it's a call to action in a community, but it's not a call to action that says, step one, find five billion dollars, you know, because you never get to step two if that's what step one is. So you don't need additional money to make these things happen. We've actually had some ex ex uh, successes saving a lot of money. In Washington State, where I, I live, work, and play now, um, about 500 miles of the state's highway system are also main streets in towns around the state of Washington. And in the past, we had this misconception that our mission was different from and perhaps in conflict with the mission of the leaders in these local communities, that what we needed to do was move trucks through the towns really fast as opposed to moving people to the towns so that they could share in the, in the local economy. But what we found with these main street highways is that all of the projects, well, 47% of the projects, had some kind of a problem with delivery. When we went in to design a solution to a problem in a community, about half the time, the scope changed over time, or the budget changed over time, or the project got delayed, um, and most of the time that happened because we were using what I, I have come to term the design, display, defend approach to street design. When I was a, a young engineer and I was learning how to design streets, what I did, I was assigned a project by my boss and I went out and took a look at the street and had a surveyor do the survey of the street and then I sat at my desk and drew up my plan for the street and had a drafter ink it all up and make it, <clears throat> make it nice. Engineering was great. And then we scheduled a public meeting and we invited the neighbors in and we displayed it up on the wall. Very proud of, look at my good work. I'm a, I'm a brilliant engineer. And then I spent the rest of the meeting taking unmitigated grief from the neighbors 
And I came to realize deserved grief because I never asked them what they wanted. I, I, I designed it, I displayed it to them, and then I was there defending it. What we found in Washington State is when you take the, the, the brilliant logic step of consulting the community ahead of time about what they might want, we were saving about 30% on each project by getting the scope right the first time, by, by building the improvement that the community wanted, and quite often an improvement that was a lot smaller than what we were talking about originally. And we reduced scope and schedule and budget changes and saved a ton, of, a ton of money. So when people argue that complete streets policies are going to cost them money, I think there's good evidence out there that there's substantial savings that might accrue. There's all sorts of guidance. Um, I, I won't read any of it to you, but there's all sorts of guidance out there. A lot of people are working on complete streets, the National Complete Streets Coalition, um, Smart Growth America as a whole. Um, AARP, uh, uh, NACTO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, the Institute of Transportation Engineers, the Congress for the New Urbanism, lots and lots and lots of folks are working on complete streets. And if you really get into transportation system planning or design, there's a lot of information that's out there. Um, I was the director of the National Complete Streets Coalition. I see my slide translated very well from the Mac world. Um, but uh, that, that ITE thing there ought to be at the top of the other column. Um, it's a really diverse group. You know, again, I, I said at the beginning, complete streets does not equal bicycle and pedestrian transportation. Transportation systems for people who walk and people who bike are a big part of complete streets, but it's a much broader issue and a much broader movement. Um, AARP is a, a founding member of the coalition and a, a big funder. Uh, the National Association of Realtors is, is very into complete streets, um, as are NACTO and uh, the Association of Landscape Architects and a lot of folks. So there are people in the business world, people in the professional world, people in the um, biking and walking world, um, and uh, organizations like uh, SRAM, which makes uh, uh, bike gear, brakes, and stuff like that. Stantec, SVR, AECOM, they're uh, engineering design companies from around the country. Lots of folks who are involved in the coalition. Um, when we started the coalition, the goal was to get 25 policies adopted. And we're over 750 now, moving on towards uh, 1,000 policies around the country, which sounds really good until you realize that there are some 60,000 uh, local governments of some sort or the other in the United States. So we, you know, we're approaching 1,000, 59,000 to go. Uh, but what's really cool about the 750 number is it includes 32 state departments of transportation, including the one that I work for when I'm not on vacation here in Vermont. Um, and when you have over 60% of the state DOTs around the country invested in complete streets, that's where most of the money gets spent. And so we're beginning to see some really cool stuff happen. Now, some of those agencies are invested in complete streets because their legislature said so or because their governor said so. And they're not really, it's, it, 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 they understand it here. They don't understand it in the gut. Others, it really is a, a new way of, of doing business. And we're seeing some really neat stuff happen. So what we found about complete streets, again, a, a lot of people like data. Um, I'm from Montana. We don't need information to have an argument. We're, we're perfectly capable of having an argument without information. Um, maybe it's the same here in Vermont. Who knows? Um, but a, a lot of people, when they're making investments, they like to have data to drive their decision making. So what we found when we looked at policy projects that were built in conformance with Complete Streets policies around the country is they're safer facilities. There's safer streets for the people using them. Collisions went down in about 70% of the projects. Injuries fell in over half of the projects. The severity of the accidents changed in a lot of the projects. And that savings in safety saved people a lot of money because every avoided collision saves you money, believe it or not. Um, and what we found is about 
18 million in collision costs in the year of our sample. And that's just on 37 projects around the country. So take that number and multiply it times all the work that's going on around the country. If we can, it's probably not good if you're in the uh, body shop business, but uh, it's, it's, it's great if you're a driver. This is a, a project in West Jefferson, North Carolina, population 1300. So it doesn't have to be New York City. Um, they adopted a complete streets policy in 2011, and they did a little project on, in, their, uh, in their town. It cost them about $300,000 to change some signals and build some curb extensions out into the street and put in some benches and some lighting. And what happened on that street, driving actually went up a little bit, but crashes went down 25%, uh, 53% fewer injuries, uh, 3 million in avoided costs, and it became an attractive place to be, and so business followed. There's been private investment, 10 new businesses, 55 new jobs, more visitors to the street. Uh, things are happening in that space because they took a complete streets approach to a particular project. We're also seeing that when you do um, projects in conformance with complete streets principles, uh, you, it's shocking when you build facilities for people to walk and people to, to, to ride bikes, more people walk and ride bikes. Um, we've had people you know, complain that why would we build a bike lane? Nobody rides a bike on that street. Yeah, I, I, I ask the engineers who ask questions like, I, I ask them, how many bridges have we built based on the number of people swimming across the river? <laughs> you know, um, so streets uh, that are built in conformance with complete streets policies encourage multimodal travel. Bicycling increases, walking increases, transit increases. But the interesting thing is that those increases happen not necessarily at the expense of the automobile. About half the projects, the, the volume of automobile traffic went up. About half of it, the volume of automobile traffic went down. Um, it's, it's, it, it doesn't chase the car out of the streetscape. It gives people choice. And when people have choices, they take advantage of them. Um, we found that they're remarkably affordable. This is a, an interesting little graph. Millions of dollars over on the left-hand side and uh, the, the list of projects going out to the right. The, Average normal cost arterial street is somewhere around three and a half, four million dollars a lane mile to construct. So you know a, a travel lane a mile long, you know roughly four million dollars. On the high end, they're up around 12, 13 million average. Now you can get really high end. I, I've seen roads that were 100 million more or more a lane mile to build, uh, depending on where you're building. I was working. Uh, with the FTA on the lower Manhattan recovery down in the bottom of Manhattan Island after the events of 9-11. Uh, of and those streets are very expensive streets to build compared to streets in other parts of the country. But this is our 37 complete streets projects plotted against those costs. And you can see an awful lot of them are very, very affordable projects. And a lot of times when you look at the people carrying capacity of a street, when you look at a street that gets congested and, and no longer moves the cars the way that it's supposed to, it's the difference between cars not moving and cars moving is sometimes 2 3%. When the volumes go up 2% or 3%, you hit this threshold where everything just kind of shuts down. So if you can provide people with choices, not so everybody rides a bike or walks or takes transit, but two or three or five or 10 percent, you can reduce the need to build lanes and lanes and lanes of capacity for automobiles because every person walking or riding a bike is one less automobile out in front of the folks that do have to drive. So look at these low cost improvements where they, they went in and they did striping or they built curb extensions, or they changed traffic signals and the like. And then you've got the really, really high-end stuff. In Novato, California, they did an incredible project where they rebuilt the entire street from property line to property line, and lots of landscaping and lots of street furnishing and the rest. That was, it was kind of expensive. But uh, the, the bottom line is that these complete streets policies are, are very, very affordable to implement. Um, here's Multnomah Street in Portland. Um, I, Moved to Portland in 1982, 
um, out of college, right out of college. We had 20% unemployment. We had net out migration. There were more people leaving than coming. And about two thirds of downtown Portland was surface parking lot. It was really attractive. Um, it was actually in a, a scary place that I lived in downtown when I first started. And I lived there in the downtown my whole 15 years in Portland. Um, it's changed a little bit. In the most recent recession, we also had 20% unemployment, but it was the place that young people went to retire. We, were, we had incredible in-migration to the community, and it was because we, we did stuff like uh, the Lloyd District and the Pearl District and the streetcar and projects like that. Multnomah Street is a street in the, the Lloyd District on the east side of the river in Portland, and at the cost of less than $100,000, they restriped some travel lanes. Uh, they created a cycle track. They glued some plastic bollards down. They added some signage and uh, some new parking uh, at the, the uh, expense of a couple of lanes of traffic. But what happened? Bicycling went up 44%. Driving went down 23%. Crashes went down, and fewer people are speeding. It's an interesting, I, I was talking about complete streets in the Washington state context. We have a thing we're implementing called practical solutions. And I was talking to an old school engineer friend of mine. I said, yeah, we're doing practical solutions in Washington state. Oh, you mean you're gonna make your engineers design stuff that's not safe? I said, no, that's, 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 that's not the case. What we've done as, as engineers is we've decided that we're gonna create a cocoon of safety around motorists giving them lots of room to recover from the errors of their ways. So, you know, we, we, you're driving a car that's six, six and a half feet wide, but you, we give you a 12 foot lane to do it in. Um, we take these standards that are appropriate for interstates and we apply them to downtown streets. And then we're appalled that people speed. Where every visual cue we're giving them, the width of the lane and, you know, clearing all of that terrible parking clutter and people clutter out of the way. Every, every visual cue we give you says, go fast. And then we put up a sign to limit your speed and we ticket you if you do it. What we're doing now with practical solutions is we're saying, okay, if we want people to drive 30 miles an hour, we're gonna design a street that's safe to drive 30 miles an hour on. But it's not safe to drive 45 miles an hour, which is how we used to design them, is we'd give a, a factor of safety. We'd use a design speed of 45 when we intended people to drive 30. Now we're using a target speed. And what that's resulting in is fewer people speeding. Shocking, when you make it safe to go a certain speed, people drive that speed and uh, they, they don't exceed it. So just linger on that for a minute. Think of the cities, the places that you are, where cars go fast. And what Roger is saying is just by design, similar to what we had a speaker, I don't know, a month ago talk about, by designing things that tell the cars to go slower, <coughs> we actually are making the streets safer and we're allowing more people to do so. Yeah. The, the, the throughput is actually greater at, at slower speeds. Throughput, which is an engineering term, meaning how many cars can get through in an hour. Yeah. Yeah. So, so can somebody just Buffalo or anybody from a place <coughs> that has one of these streets that the city, in the city, that's just the cars are going way too fast, throw it out. I'm going to Boston. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah. 90 knows an interstate. That doesn't feel like a city street. It's right by the U. It's right by the Charles. All right, what's one other? Oh, I'm from the Portland area in the States. Nice. So do you know the I-90 story, Roger? In, in Boston, <coughs> the, the interstate itself? Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the specifics. I'm familiar with the big dig. And it's, yeah, it's, the it's, it's, cars. it's very nice to walk on top of where all those cars used to be. But uh, you know, things that we do, it, planting trees. The old school thought was a tree is a barrier that someone could run into and injure themselves. So we got all the trees out of the way. Uh, parking is, uh, is not safe. So we got the parking out of the way. So you know, ways you can slow traffic down by giving people visual cues. Plant trees. When you go under that tree canopy, you slow down. Put parking back on the street. Um, put pedestrians back on the street. People, well, you're making it unsafe. No, you're not. You're making it safer for people if there are more people out there. Uh, take advantage of the technology that you have. In, in Portland, we time the traffic signals through downtown. If you drive 18 miles an hour, you'll hit all the green lights. 
but you have to drive 18 miles an hour to do it. It slows people down, but they don't have to put on the brakes. The people that drive fast, they get to drive fast to the next red light, and then they get to wait, and, and eventually they get it. So there, there are things you can do in terms of, of visual and other cues to make the street safer. Um, we also found that complete streets support local economies. We saw higher employment and property values. We saw new businesses along projects, higher retail sales along projects, private investment along projects. Are you guys familiar with uh, walk score? Walk score? Um, go online, not right now. I'm not texting, so I hope you guys aren't texting either. But um, look at walkscore.com and type in your address and find out what your walk score is. Or type in uh, your, where, you, where you work or where you lived when you were growing up. What real estate agents are finding is that people are voting with their feet and they're looking for houses that have better walk scores. It used to be when you went out to buy a house, what the real estate agents could tell you were what taxes were generally and whether the, the local school system was good or not. And every realtor I ever talked to, uh, every school system was great, you know. <laughs> but they could always tell you what the schools were like. What they want to tell you now is what your walk score is going to be. And what we found is that for every 10 points that walk score goes up, property values go up from 3,000 to 35,000 a home. Uh, so walkability is, is, is big business because that's what folks like you guys want. <clears throat> so what they did in the Millwork District in Dubuque is this was an entire district that they redeveloped. Um, if you get out to Portland or you read about Portland, you'll hear about a place called the Pearl District. Um, when we started on the Pearl District, it was an abandoned freight yard, old Burlington Northern Railroad Yard. Now it is a very, very attractive community. 15,000 residents live there. And most of them get around by walking or riding a bicycle or taking the streetcar. Dubuque was trying to do the same kind of thing. It's interesting. They said bicycling skyrocketed. Walking actually went down a little bit. And driving went up through the roof. And the reason driving went through the roof is it was an empty, dead place before. Nobody went there. Now it's super popular. It's, it's congested. And that's one of the things that you learn about congestion. As an engineer, congestion's bad. But ask a business person if they want to set up shop on an empty street. No, they, they want to be someplace where there's activity going on. But the $6.7 million that they invested in complete streets to date has brought $34 million in private investment in. When we did the Pearl District, the Pearl District was about... 250 million total in terms of the public investment. The Portland streetcar that I was the project manager for, when we built that, the initial outlay was $56 million. There's been $4 billion in private investment along the line of the streetcar. So another thing that these projects do is uh, leverage uh, real estate development. So what we learned about evaluating all these projects is that you can measure performance, and it can be simple. It's really important to distinguish between outputs and outcomes. A lot of times what we do as engineers is we measure outputs rather than outcomes um, because they're easier to measure. Um, we found a lot of institutional and organizational obstacles as opposed to technical obstacles uh, to implementing these policies. Uh, technically, it's really easy to do. But uh, when you have a planning department that doesn't talk to a public works department or you have uh, a city council who thinks uh, about the past rather than the future, um, one of the, the things that they teach at military school is don't fight the last war. Um, and what we've got is a lot of city councils that are, uh, they, they, they've grown up, they've lived uh, through the 50s and 60s, and now they're in position of power, and they're thinking about what it was like when they were young, rather than thinking about what it's like for their children or their children's children. And so they're, they're not thinking about people riding bicycles and people walking, because it's just not their worldview, it's not their experience. Um, a lack of dramatic results shouldn't be interpreted as a failure. Um, it should certainly raise questions about how you move forward. 
And the, the last thing we found is that not all the benefits are easy to monetize or quantify, uh, and they shouldn't necessarily be. Um, it's taken us a lot of time to learn how to measure cars. You know, you think about your streets and your, the city you grew up in when they put those hoses out across the street to measure automobiles. We, we measure what we value. So we measure cars moving around all the time, but you ask a city engineer, how many people walk on the sidewalk? Oh, we don't measure that. You know, um, what we found is a lot of stuff out there isn't measured. Uh, that doesn't mean it's, it's not necessarily valued by the community. And we're learning ways to measure it. So um, what we find is complete streets projects are some of the best investments a, a community can make. And uh, this is that street in Novato, uh, California. Pretty, uh, pretty wild place. So let me uh, switch gears and talk about the innovative DOT. How are we doing for time? Sure, sure, absolutely. So the innovative DOT is work that we did with uh, departments of transportation around the country. We developed a handbook of policy and practice. If you're looking for a place to learn about uh, what transportation officials are doing around the country, this is the place. Um, we've compiled the strategies that people are using. It's a full program for smart transportation. It's designed to bridge the gap between, oh, what a wonderful idea, and actually operationalizing it in an agency. Um, we've looked at how to collect money, how to allocate that money, how to price facilities, how to improve efficiency, how to move freight. There's a lot of different ideas in there um, that are uh, really helpful if you're in the transportation world, either as a, uh, an official or as a user of the system or as an advocate advocating for change. One of the things I've done over the last five years is gone around the country demonstrating those ideas with uh, uh, state DOTs around the nation. In Tennessee, we started in 2012 in January of the year. In August, we made a presentation to the commissioner. We involved everybody from the AAA uh, and the truckers to the Southern Environmental Law Center and, and others. And uh, in a series of workshops, we came up with some ideas. One of the ideas was expedited project delivery. The commissioner told a story about going into a room to sign a record of decision on an environmental document for a $50 million bypass that was going to save travelers 10 minutes getting around this little town in Tennessee. And as he was sitting down to sign it, the engineer said, you know, commissioner, if we had made $350,000 of spot improvements to two intersections, we could have saved eight of the 10 minutes. So he was, he was astounded. He did not sign the record of decision, and they didn't build the $50 million project. And we went back and did this project review where we were looking at, are we reaching points of diminishing return where we're just throwing money at, at problems, trying to get that extra two minutes out of them? The first five projects we looked at, the original cost was $180 million. After reviewing diminishing returns, the final cost came back at $9 million. We saved $171 million for the people of, of Tennessee with that review. He also put together a multimodal access fund, a $30 million package paid for with state gas taxes for bicycle and pedestrian projects. The truckers came unglued about that. Why are you using our fuel taxes for those bicyclists and pedestrians? And the commissioner said, every bicyclist and pedestrian on one of these facilities is one less person in a car in front of your truck. So pay up, shut up, and get on with it. Um, up in Minnesota, we worked again with stakeholders on making a business case for transportation investment. They wanted to invest more money in a state of good repair, maintaining their facilities in good condition, condition and more money on uh, things like uh, high occupancy toll lanes and the like. They were $12 billion short, and they wanted to know what return on investment they would get for their, their $12 billion investment. The initial $5 billion we found would return 10 to $23 billion to the state. The $7 billion to add to, you know, from, from where they wanted to be to world class was going to bring between 15 to $19 billion back to the state. So making a business case for, for doing this work was huge. And we convinced the commissioner of the Minnesota DOT to begin looking at performance metrics and quantifying performance metrics in areas like livability and public health, environmental stewardship and the like, and that, that work is ongoing. 
Here in Vermont, uh, we worked in 2012 and 2013 uh, with a series of, of stakeholders and came up with ways to strengthen the way that the Vermont Agency of Transportation is implementing the state's smart growth law because Vermont has a smart growth law. And we found that, that VTRANS is doing a pretty good job, but they could do more in the way of corridor planning. They could revise uh, their guidance, in particular the Vermont state standards for uh, street design, um, review participation and development re uh, reviews that go on in local governments, and a couple of other ways that I could get into more detail, but we want to leave room for Q&A. And, and last but not least is this project we called uh, Multimodal Development and Delivery, or M2D2, uh, where we were working with DOTs around the country on changing um, their institutional capacity to plan and design and construct and operate and maintain facilities to implement complete streets policies and, and accommodate multiple modes of transportation. So we looked at the needs and expectations of each mode. We looked at how the DOT could balance those needs. We looked at an understanding of the gaps and the barriers that exist in their policies. We basically educated them on the state of the practice and then reviewed where they were at and identified ways to get from where they were at to the state of the practice. And if you go on uh, Smart Growth America's website, you can see our recommendations for revising the Vermont state standards and actually working with uh, VTRANS on that right now. In fact, my boss, the Secretary of Transportation, is down at a meeting in DC uh, the chief engineer from VTRANS is there too, talking about ways we can design things better. So lots of good stuff going on. So I'll, I'll leave you, uh, we'll obviously do a Q&A, but I'll, I'll leave you with a quote from an environmentalist, uh, Greg Paul. Uh, we have the freedom to make uninformed, or in, informed, humane, and intelligent choices about the kind of world we want to leave for our kids and our grandkids. We also have the freedom to make uninformed, selfish, and stupid choices. So which will it be? Um, that's how to get a hold of me. To be successful, it needs to be a combination of design and investment and education. And what, what I hope to see is the community asking for the changes and, and being actively involved in these discussions. What I found from 38 years of doing this, you know, I, was, I, I ran the arterials division in Portland in the 80s. I was a consultant. Um, I was a planning director in Missoula. I was community development director in McCall, and I, I did this stuff. But if I've learned anything from all that experience is if you don't do stuff with people, they assume you're doing it to them, and you deserve what you get. So you, know, you don't want to go out and paint the bike lane on the street and remove parking in a residential neighborhood. People will go bonkers over that, that kind of thing. But the education, it's a huge part of it. And what we would do, um, it, it's one thing to hold your own meeting. You know, if we have a transportation open house, come on down. Let's see, drink beer? Go to the transportation open house. Mm, you know, you don't get a lot of people at transportation open houses. So what we had to do is we had to go out and talk to the Kiwanis and talk to the Rotarians and, and, and talk in school and stuff like that. 
I, I think a place where we're seeing a lot of, of impact is uh, like the, uh, the recycling movement went into the schools and talked to school kids. And then they'd go home and say, Daddy, why are you throwing that away? You know, but we, we talk in schools and, Daddy, why are we driving today? Why didn't we walk to the ball game? You know, that, that, that kind of thing is going on. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge part of it. But I think there are some, like I said, you can, you can educate people as they're driving with those kinds of visual cues um, and, and make that happen as well. Other questions or comments? Yes, Halsey. I envision a Portland streetcar. I don't I really know anything about it. My name's the Portland streetcar, sure. Um, Portland built this regional light rail system designed to move people from suburban communities into town. Um, in other places, Chicago has a, a commuter rail system that does the same thing. Um, Boston has a system that does the same kind of thing. But the light rail brought people from the, the suburban communities into the downtown. The problem I had as uh, the, the transportation official responsible for the downtown was if, if you're not within about a quarter mile of the stations on the light rail system, the regional system doesn't work for you because you, you're not going to walk more than about a quarter mile is what we found. And so people could drive to the park and rides on the suburban end of the system or take the local bus to the, to the stations on the suburban end. But when they got into town, if they weren't within walking distance, it really wasn't helping them. And it was so expensive to build, you know, 100 million or more a mile to build these, these regional light rail systems. And you had to take the cars out of the street to make those things happen. So what we were looking at for implementing the central city plan for, for downtown Portland and the surrounding neighborhoods was a collector distributor system for the regional rail system, a way to get people from where they lived or where they worked to and from the regional rail and connect the activity centers up, connect Northwest Portland with Portland State University, with the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, different you know, districts of the downtown. And so we came up with the streetcar, which is a, a lightweight, it's like light, light rail. It operates in the street with traffic. So it's, it's in the lane and cars can be in the lane too. Uh, the stops are curb extensions, it's really cheap. We built the whole thing at about uh, 12 million a mile for the first system versus the 100 million a mile that we we're building light rail for. Um, and it extended the range of uh, the reach of the regional rail system. And it connected places like the Pearl District with Portland State University and the like. So a different way of doing business. And uh, that model has been taken. They built one just recently in Tucson uh, through the University of Arizona. They're building one in Atlanta with the Beltline. Um, they're, they built a couple lines in Seattle. They built one in Tacoma. It's, it's, it's happening around the country. And we think we're really cool until we go to Europe. And, you know, I, I was an Army brat, so I went to high school in Stuttgart. And in the 70s in Stuttgart, we had 13 systems, 13 different rail lines in a town of about 500,000 people. And I got to Portland, and we had one. You know, so it, it, it's, it, that's what streetcar is. Others, questions or comments? Ben. So, your overall career experience, mm -hmm. what's the most common sector to have, which, you know, a good plan for pushback? Is it private? Is it residents? Is it the council itself? Who tends to? Yeah, uh, different people have different, different worldviews. And what I find quite often, uh, the, the, the grumpiest folks, if you don't engage them properly, people in the retail industry, you know, retail, the future is right here. You know, I, I, I work in government. I have, I have 7,000 employees and an annual budget of about $7.5 billion. And I think in terms of annual budgets or, or biennial budgets and the rest of that, I've, I've been a small business person. You think about meeting payroll. You know, you think about keeping the lights on and the doors open. And so when people propose change, you have to be very careful how you do it. You know, I thought planting trees would be wonderful. You know what trees do? They, they block signs. People can't see my sign because that freaking tree's in the way. You know, why chop it down? You know, you, you get that kind of, so you, you have to work with folks like that. But another group that can be very grumpy is young parents, if you don't explain it right. Seniors can be very grumpy if you don't, anybody can be grumpy. It goes back to my, my you know, if you don't do things with people, they assume you're doing it to them. 
So I think there are strategies that you can reach out to the, the, the small business community. I think there's strategies you can reach out to seniors, strategies you can re reach out to young, young parents. Um, you know, commuters can be really grumpy folks. One of the things that I, I find is that, you know, as soon as people jump in the car, they think they have these rights that they don't have otherwise. I, 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 I hate who I turn into when I jump into a car, which is why I don't do it as much as I used to. Um, but we, you just have to work with folks. Um, and you have to also understand, um, I've been this long enough to know that you're not going to get consensus. You know, you, I don't shoot for consensus anymore. I shoot for consent. You know, if people can live with it, you know, if, if you know, I say, okay, at the end of the day, I'm sure there are people in here that don't like it, but can you live with it? You know, and, and, and that's good enough. All right, do any of you guys come from places that it really works, you know, where the systems are very walkable and bikeable and you feel the streets are safe to cross? Yeah, where? Um, I'm from Portland, Okay, so we know Portland is. Any others from places where you feel like, wow, this really works? I can feel that. Where? Uh, Fountain, Maine. Maine. Is that ring about? Yeah. You know, it's amazing. I, I, I have lived, I just moved to Olympia, Washington, which is a pretty walkable place. And before that, I lived in Billings, Montana. And in Billings, the motorist has the right of way. And if you're crossing the street, you wait for the motorists to go by because they're going to run you down otherwise. I spent the weekend in Montpelier. Montpelier is a very safe, walkable place. You, you even make like eye contact with the crosswalk. Everybody stops. And, and, and lets you buy, which is pretty cool. Muriel, what were you going to say? Yarmouth Maine. Yarmouth Maine also. Hey. Oh, Fanny. Yarmouth. Hey. <laughs> Anybody else from places that really work or really don't work? Eight. Is it eight? Andrew. Andrew. Tucson. Tucson. But Tucson is hugely spread out, so maybe the downtown is starting to. I, just, <coughs> I visited. I don't live there. I visited. I just felt like it was. I, I only walked. Only walk, okay. Yeah. And you're doing work in Tucson. I've, I've done some work in Tucson. That's an interesting question. Sarah? Uh, well, I live in like the downtown of San Diego, California, so that area is really walkable, but then like once you, and like San Diego is access to like the, the trolley and buses and things like that, it's very accessible, but then once you like leave that little like sphere where the trolley runs, you're kind of. Yeah, the gas lamp district is pretty cool. Yeah, that's like yeah. where I live. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, Ridgefield, Connecticut, it's like all just tight roads and nowhere to like walk or bike or anything. Is it good or bad? It's bad. Bad. Yeah. Ridgefield, uh, Connecticut, is that the best? On a 25. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, Jules. I was wondering if I could ask a question. Um, so like the biggest issue with the Connecticut <coughs> Highway like in California, it's, I live like an hour from her, but uh, it's like there's a bunch of people that are getting into accidents with bikers. Mm -hmm. So when I was in high school, they changed the law so that the biker has the right of way. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, like, do you think that's fair? Also, it has to deal with, like, we don't have the bike lanes, which is part of the road. Like, mm -hmm. it's so scary driving. I always struggle to hit a bike. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you, you look at uh, providing a transportation network, and you have parts of the network that are designed where the, the people walking come first. And you know places that are more transitory and the like. Uh, the, the policies that I've seen that I think work particularly well. It, the, the pedestrians are, are number one in in every situation, but you don't see a lot of pedestrians out on the freeway. You know it's just not, it's not designed for that. Um, but if you create a network where you can get around town on a bicycle, you don't have to be able to get around town on every street on a bicycle to make that happen. But you can get around town on a bicycle. You can get around town walking, and it's safe. You can get around town on transit. Uh, you don't worry about every single piece of every street in the network as long as the network is there. And, and you're honest about it being accessible, because one of the things I hate to see as well, we won't put a bicycle lane on this facility because we've got a lane three blocks over here that's, that's you know, separate but equal. You know, <laughs> that, that kind of thing doesn't work. Um, I, I think you know training people to understand that um, when somebody steps off the curve, you ought to slow down and stop 
rather than you know, insisting that you have a right to go through. And, and you know, the, uh, so back to the earlier comment about, about education, I think that's a lot of it too. So we're just going to take one or two more. We, I don't know, Glenn, if you want to say anything, because we have somebody who lives and works and bikes. And if I could introduce you, you know, very involved with the, was the owner of the old spokes home, if you guys have ever been down there with your bike. So Glenn, any thoughts you have on Burlington or question? Well, or? It's really interesting. Uh, I would invite anybody to take a trip out to North Avenue. So North Avenue uh, goes from downtown, passes the high school, and then goes out to Burlington's new North End. And right now there's a tremendous controversy right around this, in my estimation, about making that uh, particular route more friendly to um, cyclists, walkers, and uh, other forms of, uh, of uh, modes of transport. There's a huge uh, movement in opposition to change because a lot of people out there rightly fear, in my estimation, that they may be uh, that uh, traffic may be uh, slowed down. They may not be able to move as freely. Uh, these bike lanes, they, they they want the city wants to do a pilot project right now on North Avenue to put in some. I want to call it like a full bike lane, just a, a, a demonstration project um, to give people a chance to see if maybe this could work and, and uh, cyclists and walkers could use this, this area uh, uh, in, a, in a much easier fashion. But the, from what I understand, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, opposition out there to even the pilot project because they don't want anything forced uh, down their throats. So a lot of people feel as though the, the process wasn't inviting to get input, and then it's just being jammed down their throats. So there was a, a, an interesting point you made, uh, uh, Roger, about uh, inviting, you know, the, the correct processes of inviting the neighborhoods to, uh, to uh, or the, you know, the residents to participate. But they don't want any part of it. And, and if you go out there now, you'll see sign after sign after sign along this corridor, um, bikers against the project. I don't know of any bikers against it, any other residents against it. So you are living in a, in a great um, opportunity to see some of this. So do you guys, North Avenue, do you know that? Goes out to the new North End. Okay, so big debate about making more bike lanes and know it well. You may hear about this tomorrow. I may, yeah. I, and yeah. I was uh, really surprised to see that you've made it to a few city council meetings to understand that uh, we are fighting that well <coughs> um, from that uh, the perspective of folks who are now in power who uh, have come out. One very uh, well-known councillor has come out and made the comment that he feels as though uh, more bicycles in the streets are just going to slow things down and clog up the uh, roadways. Yeah. So reaction on you? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the specific situation, but the, the process and the resulting kerfuffle, you know, I, I, I have ex experienced that. Um, and, and again, having facts sometimes helps. Sometimes it just, it, it just gets all screwy. But uh, there are different ways of doing this. Uh, what they, they do in uh, Portland, we had this neighborhood traffic management program where we would come in and on a neighborhood basis, we would just, we would study it to death. And, and these things were costing a lot of money to put in because we just studied the jeepers out of it. Seattle, what they would do is they'd put it in temporarily with orange cones and six months later they'd have a vote and if it passed, they'd, they'd put the concrete in and there was a traffic circle. No study, no analysis, they just put the cones in. We're gonna put them in, we're gonna see if it works. If it fails, out they come. If it passes, you know. Uh, New York City, uh, Jeanette Sadek Khan, who was Mayor Bloomberg's transportation person, said we're gonna put some stuff in and see how it works. And they did it with paint and you know stuff like that. And, and when it worked, it came back later and, and did the more permanent stuff. There's a movement in the planning world called tactical urbanism where they're trying things out. 
they'll 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 take the parking off of, of a street and they'll put little street parklets in and stuff like that and just try it for a weekend just to see how it goes and they'll do it for a block to see what what happens. Um, so you know, I, I think the idea of let's let's do a pilot, see what happens. If it if it doesn't work, we'll pull it back out. Um, in Aspen, Colorado, I'd, I'd spent five years living down the valley from Aspen and working up there. They implemented paid parking in the downtown. A huge stink. They had a, a honk-in where when they were doing the, the, the vote, they, they surrounded City Hall with cars at noon and they honked their horns for a whole hour um, protesting this paid parking thing. And the city council said, you know what, we're going to put it in and six months from now we're going to have an advisory vote and if, the, if people don't like it, we'll take it out. They put it in, six months later, 70% passed. Said they wanted to keep the paid parking because it was doing such a good job managing the problems that they were having with congestion in the town. So, you know, when you, you implement these new ideas and new landscapes, you, they're, they're prone to controversy. There are lots of different ways of addressing them. Um, I, I think starting with a conversation, or at least an opportunity for conversation, and I'm sure the people that were doing it thought that they, they had. Um, demonstration projects are another good thing. Um, a lot of times if you can, you can find a road that's maybe less controversial than that number one road and put it in there and see how it works and build your way up to it. Lots of different ways of, of doing business. But you know, saying, hey, let's, let's put it in and try it, and if it doesn't work, we'll take it out. Paint is relatively cheap. And in, in an environment like the environment that you guys live in, paint doesn't last that long on the street. You know, the snow plow blades and others take care of it. So, you know, I, I, I wish you guys the best. Um, but we can talk. We can talk after. But one of the things I noticed uh, yesterday when we were coming into town from the south is you can really tell when you cross the line from South Burlington to Burlington. You know, you don't need a big sign because the whole nature of the space changes and that's you know if you're thinking about how can you use design cues to change behavior go down to the south and, and come in on, on route 7 and just see how it changes when you come into town. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Ten minutes.